Well, hello and welcome to our Sabbath School program. Um, happy Sabbath to everyone. We are so glad that you are tuned in and that you're joining us. Uh, we know that there are a lot of different options for you every Sabbath morning. So the fact that you're here with us is truly a treat. Um, welcome to uh, the Panama City Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, if you are joining us from outside of the panhandle, please let us know where you're from. We always love to get acquainted with each other. Every once in a while, we get people from overseas, and uh, we get people from different parts of the United States. And it's always, a, it's always good to get uh, acquainted with uh, new friends. So please let us know where you're from. Uh, this Sabbath, we are continuing our study, our topic, our quarter discussion on education and we've seen many different facets of education in light of scripture and we've learned that education uh, according to the bible is significantly more comprehensive than the usual uh, way that we look at education as 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 formal education and we are in our fifth lesson, lesson number five, and uh, we are looking at Jesus as the master teacher. Uh, it's kind of impossible to really talk about education without addressing the fact that, of course, in every education, you have an instructor, you have a teacher. And in this particular uh, uh, spiritual education that we're talking about, there's also an instructor, and this instructor is none other than Jesus himself. And uh, many, many, many would consider Jesus to be the greatest teacher that has ever lived. Not only those within the church, but many, many historians, many even, even those of other religions outside of Christianity, have considered Jesus to be the greatest teacher who ever walked on the earth. Uh, we don't have time to look at all of those <laughs> different types of people, but it says a lot. It definitely communicates how powerful the implications to all of that is, because what that shows is that um, Jesus' impact is not just within the church, but it's actually across um, all different levels of humanity, not just within Christianity. So we're going to take a look a little bit about um, Christ and um, uh, his role as a teacher and, of course, God's role in uh, educating us in our walk with him. So without any uh, further ado, let's go ahead and bow our heads and let's have prayer and we're going to jump right in. Let's pray together. Father, we're just so thankful that this beautiful Sabbath day we get to uh, enjoy it uh, in the company, in the virtual company, <laughs> for many uh, of those like-minded people who are here in the same channel, the same streaming channel um, that we are in. And that shows that we have community. We have people that also are interested in their spiritual well-being. There are people that recognize that... Uh, in times like these, where we find ourselves in, in utter chaos, there is no other better place to be but in your presence, and especially looking at and investigating and hearing your words. So we pray in a special way that you guide us, that you direct our minds, direct our thoughts, help us, Lord, to glean uh, many things from your word, not just for the sake of uh, intellectual exercise, but also for practical application. Help us, Lord, to take away from this lesson things that we can implement in our personal lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we are looking at uh, Jesus as the master teacher. And uh, our memory text is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. And it reads, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
Now this text is loaded with many, many different things. So many things we won't even be able to unpack at all because our time doesn't allow for it. But as you see here, you have uh, a beautiful reference here uh, on creation because it talks about uh, God commanding light to shine out of darkness. Um, and of course, command did is a past tense. So it's referring to a historical event where God commanded light to shine out of the darkness. And of course, this is a reference to the creation account. This is reference to Genesis chapter 1. And what I love about this text is that what, what, what the author is doing, which is the Apostle Paul, is he's making a comparison with what Christ did to the planet in the creation week um, and he's paralleling that to what Christ is able to do in the minds and in the hearts of people. In other words, the earth was without form and it was void and it was empty and it was, uh, it was chaos. And then the Bible says, let there be light. So, the Bible clearly says that Christ spoke light into the darkness of the planet. And that created a series of events that led the earth to become a beautiful uh, habitat. Uh, and of course, we see this in Genesis chapter 1. Paul basically makes the parallel that just as Christ is able to transform and to enlighten a dark planet, he's able to transform and to enlighten a dark mind and a dark heart this is so beautiful it's so poetic and what it does is it shows us that um, no one is beyond the reach of God's enlightenment and of course we know of course that this is kind of another w education and enlightenment kind of are they're, they're related so in order for Christ to give us that enlightenment uh, we we have to of course hear that word here that let there be lights we have to allow that word to uh to to enter into the darkness of our lives and uh that's that's beautiful because it shows us how powerful and how capable god is of taking just about anyone and uh transforming them and ex and having them experience something really powerful um our lesson brought out something really cool uh, relating to Billy Graham. Uh, of course, Billy Graham, famous evangelist, been all over the world and has done many evangelistic campaigns and um, filled many stadiums and presented Christ to many, many, many people. Uh, we're told here in the lesson that Billy Graham tells the story of when he visited soldiers at a field hospital in the company of their general. One young soldier was so mangled that he lay face down on a canvas and steel contraption. A doctor whispered to Graham, I doubt he'll ever walk again. The soldier made a request of the general, Sir, I fought for you, but I've never seen you. Could I see your face? So the general got down, slid under that canvas and steel contraption, and talked with the soldier. As Graham watched, a tear fell from the soldier onto the general's cheek. Beautiful story. And it, the parallel is made with the Sabbath school lesson. At the time of Jesus' birth, humanity lay mangled and bleeding in need of a healing vision of God. It is as though humankind pleaded, O oh God, could we see your face? In sending his son to this planet, the father sent the master teacher on a mission to show humankind his face. Ever since, we have had the wondrous privilege of beholding the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What a story. That is so beautiful. That is so moving. It's so beautiful. And the parallel is even more um, uh, heartwarming. The, the idea that just like the soldier uh, wounded and mangled, he wanted to see his captain's face. And this is the essence of the incarnation. This is the whole essence of 
God becoming a man and entering into the human experience. I always like to say it by uh, describe it by saying that God put your shoes on or the or the other idea of God moved into the neighborhood. Yeah, he came close so that we can see him. This is the whole idea with Jesus being a master teacher because in order to really do an effective uh, job of teaching, a teacher must come close to his students, must come close to his pupils. And Christ did that very thing. He came close to his people. Now, it's interesting because right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. And of course, with COVID, many, many, if not the majority of uh, educational institutions have um, gone ahead and discontinued their in-person um, instruction and has and they have resorted to an online of course virtual type of uh, class Sim similar to what we're doing here um, and the beautiful thing is that um, as awesome as that is and even though of course we could take advantage of that there's really nothing else there's nothing comparable to an actual uh, in-person instructor who is um, physically close, uh, giving instruction and demonstrating uh, instruction. And that is the most effective way that a teacher can convey his uh, values to his students. And that is exactly the way that Jesus did it. And that's, that's why it's such a powerful, powerful um, concept that Christ was the master teacher, is the master teacher, and what he did as master teacher is he didn't remain uh, teaching long distance. Of course, we know in the Old Testament he spoke through the prophets. In fact, we're going to take a look at a text here that says just that. But what we, what we will discover is that he um, crescendoed into climaxing <clears throat> by arriving himself on planet Earth so that he could come close to humanity to provide an education for salvation, an education of sanctification, an education of reform. And all of these things um, are spelled out in the life of Jesus. So we're going to take a look at um, our first question here, which is, what are the most important points the apostle makes about Jesus at the beginning of the book? of Hebrews. So the book of Hebrews in the beginning uh, the apostle makes several different points. So let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 1 and we're going to take a look at the first couple four verses. Um, first few verses here. Uh, Hebrews is a very very powerful book. It's actually my favorite New Testament book. It's uh, not the easiest book to understand. Uh, one must confess. <laughs> And it has a really beautiful blend of Old and New Testaments. But in the beginning of the book of Hebrews, uh, the Apostle Paul, who I believe is the author of this letter, um, he describes uh, Christ and he describes a little bit of the activity of, uh, uh, of, of heaven in trying to um, impact, inform, communicate, uh, direct, guide, educate the followers uh, on the planet. And notice what it says in verse 1 of chapter 1 as we read uh, ver the first four verses. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Wow. Wow. Powerful. Powerful text there. Quite quite the way to begin uh, a letter. So here we have 
a very rich uh, description of of God uh, making a plan, developing a system in order to uh, effectively communicate with his followers. And the question is, what are the most important points the apostle makes about Jesus at the beginning of the book? There's several. Let's take a look at some of them. Number one, uh, one of the most uh, important points that Paul makes here in the beginning of the book of Hebrews is that God speaks. Amen? <laughs> in order to introduce, in order to be an, an effective teacher, in order to be a master teacher, a teacher has to have the ability to speak, uh, the ability to communicate. Yeah, and what we find is that not only does God speak, but God speaks multiple times. In other words, it's not just a one one session, one lecture course. It is a series of lectures. It is a series of communications that God uh, is able to do and that it is required to do because, of course, uh, in order for us to experience this spiritual education, we require continuity. We require follow-up. We need more. We can't just... Uh, we can't really just um, be satisfied with one experience of having this interaction with God. God speaks. He speaks in multiple times. It's not just once. I know some of us have had uh, pretty remarkable experiences coming to Christ. And that's beautiful. But God didn't finish <laughs> communicating to you when you came to Christ. God still wants to communicate to you today. Yeah? God speaks. He speaks multiple times, and God speaks in different ways, okay? And he speaks in different ways at times to the same individual. He's not always going to come to you in the exact same manner. And also, God speaks to different people in different ways. He doesn't communicate exactly the same to everybody because everybody's a little different, yeah? So we know that God, of course, speaks through conviction. He speaks through the power of the Holy Spirit. He speaks through his word. He speaks through the community of believers. Uh, God at times speaks through our fellow brothers and sisters in our fellowship to exhort us and to provoke us to be, uh, to be better. God speaks through them. And of course, that comes from friendship. That comes from relationship. God speaks through friendship. And um, God speaks through providence. God speaks through uh, the events of our lives, uh, personal experiences. Uh, and, and, of course, he speaks through, um, <clears throat> gives us impressions, gives us uh, powerful um, impressions in our mind. And, of course, he speaks through, speaks to our conscience. So it, he speaks in different ways in multiple times. God is our professor. And in order to be, experience spiritual education, we have to have, we have to understand. First of all, our, our instructor needs to communicate, which he does. And uh, he needs to communicate at our level, and he needs to make it in such a way where he uh, tries all, of, all avenues possible to communicate. And uh, those of you that are familiar with uh, uh, formal education, particularly the, the lower grades, uh, are acquainted with the reality that uh, in order to arrest the attention of the lower grades, uh, one must acquire multiple different ways of conveying information. Otherwise, you're going to lose your audience. <laughs> so in a sense, God is kind of doing this with us as well. He's speaking to us in many different ways, and he's speaking to us throughout our spiritual journey. Another uh, very powerful point that the Apostle Paul makes here in the first part of the book of Hebrews is that the clearest communication that we have received from God is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ coming to the world has illuminated and has revealed to us exactly who the Father is, exactly who God is. This was a question that, that many have had and many continue to have. What is God like? Uh, what is his personality like? God has communicated through Jesus. Of course, Jesus is God himself. He's the Son of God. Uh, and of course, Christ, um, as the Son of God, has come into the world to be the avenue of communication between heaven 
and earth. So the clearest, the most beautiful, the most sublime uh, avenue of communication that we have is through the life and through the person of Jesus himself. Yeah. Also, another really interesting thing that the Apostle Paul makes out here in the book of Hebrews. He basically, and these are my, these are my words here. <laughs> he basically says that angels are impressive, right? You look through the Bible, angels do a lot of cool things. A lot of remarkable things, a lot of supernatural things. But what we see here is that Jesus is superior to the angels. He's more powerful and he's more impressive. Yeah, so angels are impressive, but they're not impressive at the level of Jesus. This is very, very important to understand because why? Because throughout Scripture, God uses angels to communicate. Yeah. God uses angels to convey messages. This is, this is what angel means in, in the original Greek. Uh, angelos. It means a messenger. And that's what an angel is. It's a messenger. So even though God has used angels throughout uh, recorded history, uh, Christ here in, 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 being you, is in being used um, or being voluntarily uh, used, of course, because he's God himself, uh, is just it is more powerful than the avenues of communication that God has done through Gabriel and through some of the other angels that we see in the course of uh, the Bible, the history of Scripture. Also, uh, in Hebrews chapter one, Paul brings out a very and he brings up a very interesting word uh, in the first uh, chapter of Hebrews in the passage that we just read. He talks about Christ being the express image of God, okay? The express image of God. Now, the interesting thing is that the word image in the Greek is the word, and listen to how it sounds. Well, you could see, you could see the way it's actually transliterated. Character, okay? Christ is the express character of God. The image of God. The word image there in the original language is character. What English word does character sound like? It's where we get the word character. Yeah? So really, the translation could read, Christ is the express character of God. Okay? So just as God is, this is what Jesus is like. So when you see Jesus, when you hear Jesus... When you experience Him in your life, you're experiencing God the Father as well. They are one and the same. They are two distinct beings, of course, but they are identical in character. They are the same. And the word character, very interestingly enough, is also used and is also involved in the idea of um, a seal when, uh, when you have, of course... The uh, in, 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 in ancient times, the impression a seal makes on wax. So this is the, this is the word that uh, kind of is used also for this, and it makes it even more powerful. It illustrates what Christ is. Christ is that seal that goes in wax, right? And, he, and basically lives, leaves the, 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 the identical, the exact image of what God the Father is. Is like and it's not only used with seals it's also used when it comes to uh, the representation or the stamp on a coin yeah and of course we know that the uh, many coins have a particular representation has an image of a ruler a president a king etc and just as that's the case with the currency of many empires and nations, this is the same word that Paul uses to describe what Jesus is. Jesus is the exact imprint, the exact character. And that is so important for us to understand. So very, very um, practical, very simple, but yet at the same time it shows us how special it is uh, for Christ to enter into our world and become one of us. So because Christ is the master teacher, 
And because God communicates through Christ, we must listen. And not only must we listen, but we must watch. Because we know, of course, that education is not just conveying information, but is also demonstrate, demonstrating by example. And one of the beautiful things that we have with the teaching and the professorship, if, if, if I can use that word, of, of Christ is that not only does he speak, but he actually demonstrates what he speaks. He actually, uh, his actions are really just his words uh, coming into life. So we as followers of Jesus, in order to uh, be able to not only benefit, but appreciate and, and continue in this educational process, we must listen to the, to the, to the teacher. We must watch the teacher. How do we listen to the teacher? How do we watch the teacher? Well, of course, the Word of God is one of the most excellent manners in which we could listen to God's Word. We could listen to His voice, listen to His instruction, listen to His counsel. Yeah, And then how do we watch? Well, we can watch by looking at the example of Jesus in the Gospels. Look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Another way that we can watch, by the way, the example of Jesus is by looking at the examples of other godly people in our lives. Now, obviously, we need that's, there's a word of caution. Because <laughs> we know even those who are godly people, they have bad days, right? So we got to be careful. But God at times demonstrates uh, his character to us through the, the demonstrations of our brothers and sisters in the faith. And that's actually a beautiful thing. So we must listen and we must watch if we're going to be faithful students of God and if we're going to be faithful students uh, in his class that he uh, has in store for us. Question, who is Jesus and what do we learn from him hebrews chapter one has uh already shared some things but we're going to compare what we read in hebrews chapter one with second corinthians chapter four verses one through six let's take a look at second corinthians chapter four verses one through six if you have your bibles please <clears throat> join me in second corinthians chapter four verses one through six and of course six is um our memory text but verses one through five will give us kind of a nice context or a background. In verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, Therefore, we have this ministry as we have received mercy. We do not lose heart. Since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, once again, we have the word image, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Wow. That is a powerful, powerful passage. So, uh... Who is Jesus and what do we learn from him? Well, um, to put it simply, to synthesize what 2 Corinthians 4 was trying to communicate, basically, Jesus is the light of the knowledge of God. And he is the one that removes our veils of darkness. The text clearly said that we're blinded. We're naturally blinded by the light. We're blinded by the gospel. We're blinded by the good news that God is, He exists, He's amazing, He speaks, and He pursues us, and He loves us. That beautiful truth, by nature, our minds um, are blind to it. So Christ is the light switch. Uh, it's, 
Christ is the what illuminates the truth of of, of that fact, and uh, that's why Paul says we preach Christ. We don't preach ourselves because if we preach ourselves, then we're never really going to allow people to have this aha moment. They're not going to have an an enlightenment experience. They're just going to have really cool information. Yeah. Paul's like, we're not in the business of giving cool information. We're in the business of presenting Christ because Christ is the one that can uh, open the eyes. Christ is the one that can change the course of a person's life, the course of a person's uh, decisions. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is highlighting the fact that Jesus is the light and he is the one that illuminates the darkness of our lives. Question, the Bible tells us to be imitators of God. What does that mean and what can we learn about Jesus? So the Bible does use this phrase, imitating imitators of God, and is actually found in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God, but notice what it says, as dear children okay <laughs> one of the things that's interesting and I, I don't know how many of you have siblings i have two older brothers i am the youngest of three and um those of you that are the youngest and those of you that have younger siblings know that the youngers in particular have a, an annoying habit <laughs> of being a copycat of doing everything that the older siblings do it's just that's just the way it works and yours truly it has been guilty of that as well because I'm the youngest. So this idea of being imitators of God as dear children, it kind of uses it in a, in a more endearing way. But children, are, by nature, they are sponges and they basically mimic what they see and what they hear. So the Bible tells us to be imitators of God like children are, meaning that assuming we are watching and we are listening to our divine master teacher, then we, by, by natural uh, instinct, would want to imitate that which we're seeing and that which we're listening. We must imitate God. Now, the beautiful thing about imitating God is that God is beautiful, okay? <laughs> so if we imitate God, that means then that our life is going to be beautiful because we're going to be imitating a wave of beautiful uh, activity, for the lack of a better term. Um, you know, edification, truth, love, acceptance, embrace, uh, affirmation, kindness, courtesy, uh, consideration. I mean, you could go down the list. All of these things, all of these things, are what it means to be an imitator of God. The problem comes when we don't imitate God and we basically are kind of doing our own thing in the name of religion, in the name of church, and in the name of Christianity. That's where we get ourselves into trouble, and that's when we become uh, uh, a, uh, a people repellent. Uh, people don't want to follow uh, a religion that is, first of all, that's man-made, and second of all, that is contrary to the teachings of Jesus. That's why Jesus, when, it, when he was here on earth, he was, uh, he was irresistible. Uh, granted, a lot of people rejected him, but the vast majority of people, they were just attracted to him. And that's because of his character. That's because of who he was. And if that's true of Jesus, then his followers must imitate the way Jesus was here on earth. This is what Ephesians chapter uh, 5 verse 1 says. Question, what does John's gospel tell us about the results of Jesus becoming human, the light he brought, and the qualifications he possessed? I want to invite you to go to the gospel of John. We're going to look, look at John chapter 1, and we're going to take a look at two verses. John chapter 1, first verse 14, and then we're going to take a look at verse 18. Question is, what does John's gospel tell us about the results of Jesus becoming human, the light that he brought, and the qualifications that he possessed. And uh, John chapter 1 and verse 14 and 18, uh, 
read the following. Verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So what does John's Gospel tell us about the result of Jesus becoming human? The light he brought and the qualifications he possessed. Well, first of all, John, the Gospel of John clearly establishes that no one has seen God directly because obviously we would die. His glory would consume us. So number one, no one has ever seen God directly. But according to John chapter 1, verse 14, it tells us that Jesus uh, became flesh. Other translations use the expression, he pitched his tent with us. Isn't that beautiful? He tabernacled with us. He became one uh, of the same family. He became part of our race. Yeah? So when Christ came, became part of our race, and, and he is the one that is in the bosom of the Father, no one has ever seen, uh, no human has seen the Father directly, that basically means that when Christ came, we had the most intimate uh, depiction, uh, representation of, of the character of God. And when you see John chapter 1, you also see this idea that we beheld his glory. So Jesus made sure that when he came, he came close enough to us that we could actually see the glory of God. And what I love about that is that it shows us that God is not um, a germaphobe. Amen? <laughs> He's not the type of God who is going to be uh, so repulsed and so uh, his sensibilities are going to be uh, offended to the point where he wants to be at a distance from us. But rather it shows that the, the, the results, what it shows of, of the incarnation, is that Christ, uh, is that God was serious about making sure that humanity had the clearest picture of who God the Father really was. Education, page 75 and 76, um, share this beautiful statement. Quote, Christ came to restore this knowledge. He came to set aside the false teachings by which those who were atheists had. Is that what it says? Sorry, I read it wrong. Let's read it again. He came to set aside the false teaching by which those secular-minded people had. No, it doesn't say that. He came to set aside the false teaching by which all those worldlings out there had. No, it doesn't say that. We got to read it carefully, my friends. He came to set aside the false teaching by which those who what? Who claimed to know God had misrepresented him. That, my friends, is powerful. He came to manifest the nature of his law, to reveal in his own character the beauty of holiness. This is the reason why Jesus became man. This is why Jesus was um, <clears throat> became flesh. This is why the incarnation took place. And notice what it highlights. It says that Christ had to come to undo not what the secular-minded people or the atheists or the unchurched have done. No. He had to undo what those in the church have had done. Because apparently there was false teachings that was being propagated by those who claimed to know God, but really they were misrepresenting Him. So Christ had to come in person and He had to rectify the, the distorted picture that other people had at, at the, at the, at really at the guilt of those who claim to follow him. We as a church have to be very careful, my brother and my sister, that we are not presenting a twisted picture of who God is. And unfortunately, we have not been innocent of that. And there have been many a time where people who have been sincere, uh, have been honestly searching for truth, searching for God, searching for meaning. However, because we were just too hung up on ourselves, um, we they were exposed to some false teachings 
that had misrepresented misrepresented who God really was. So instead of seeing the character of and of uh, the beauty of holiness, as this statement brings up, they saw a very unappealing picture of God. So really, we have to do a self-assessment. We have to diagnose ourselves and ask ourselves a question. What picture am I presenting to others um, about God? Because, of course, those of us that are in the church, we are the ones that are mentioned here. This is not talking about secular-minded people. These are talking about religious people. This is talking about church folk. And another statement uh, in education uh, quotes, the revelation of God for the uplifting of humanity. And this statement actually is um, in reference to the idea of everything that Jesus did in his life was for dot, 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 the revelation of God for the uplifting of humanity. This is why we are here. This is why we exist. This is why the church exists, is to reveal who God is and to uplift humanity. Unfortunately, the church, unfortunately, too often, instead of revealing who God is, we don't reveal who God is, we reveal pretty much an earthly institution that has a couple of spiritual things here and there. And instead of uplifting humanity, what we do is we actually sever our connection with humanity and we create a bigger chasm between church and the rest of the world. And of course, the notion that we have to kind of stay away from the world, the world is icky, the world is germaphobed, um, or this is, this is a problem. This wasn't the religion of Jesus. Jesus didn't conduct himself uh, by creating chasms uh, with the people that he came to save. And the church, unfortunately, by behaving this manner, uh, becoming some kind of like an, uh, an exclusive elite uh, VIP group is misrepresenting God. And the revelation of God is not being seen. It's the revelation of an earthly institution that is not really following the principles of God. So it's, it's sobering words to, to all of us. Question, what was the setting of Jesus' statement? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why did Jesus make it? And we're talking about, of course, the Father, the Son, the Son revealing who the Father is, the fact that a, a teacher must have to come close. We're in the middle of an education. And the biggest education, of course, that we need is understanding who God is. Because if we understand who God is, then life makes more sense. And if we understand who God is, by the way, serving Him is not that complicated. Committing to Him is not that complicated. Because when we really figure out who He is, we cannot resist but be under the wow factor. Like, wow, we serve an incredible God. So beautiful, so amazing, so exciting, so edifying. But unfortunately... Um, because, because at times we don't have that uh, experience, then we have to kind of like, it's almost like a, we, have to, we have to force ourselves to love him, force ourselves to worship him, instead of just letting the natural reaction of worship and love to flow out uh, on the foundation of understanding who God is. So in light of that, why did Jesus say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? Uh, beautiful words, very important words, but what was the setting what was the background? In John chapter 14, um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read uh, not the entire chapter, but we'll read the first couple of verses here. Uh, Jesus begins in verse 1 by saying, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have no, not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. See? So this is kind of the backdrop. This is the setting of the statement. Why did Jesus make this statement? Well, the, the, first of all, we need to understand in John 14, 
Jesus began the chapter by making a beautiful promise. And, he can, and what we see is that immediately after the promise was made, Thomas doubted. And on top of the fact that Thomas doubted, Philip was a bit unsatisfied and he was a bit picky. He wanted to basically see the Father. He said, show us the Father and it'll suffice us. And uh, I know it's very easy to, we're very quick as Bible readers to kind of, you know, attack Thomas and Philip. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we all have a little bit of Thomas and a little bit of Philip inside of every single one of us. And knowing that that's the case, what that also, what that also shows is that um, we, we at times doubt God and we at times, of course, uh, don't have total faith in Him. When we see Jesus, we are seeing the Father. We're seeing the highest authority in the universe. When Jesus demonstrates uh, love, unconditional love, for a, a woman that is being accused by authorita uh, authoritative uh, men, and He doesn't condemn her and embrace her, we are seeing the character of the highest, most powerful being in the entire universe. My friends, that is great news because you can look at the universe with confidence and you know that beyond the cosmos, beyond the stars, you have somebody that loves you. And this is something that's groundbreaking. And we, even as church people, forget this, uh, unfortunately, too often. And we need to constantly be reminded of this. Question, what is Paul's concerned about regarding the Christian community in Philippi? Of course, we know that Paul worked quite a bit in the city of Philippi and in the letter to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul addresses multiple things. Uh, we looked at a, a couple of things early on, but let's take a look and see what is, is it that the Apostle Paul addresses in uh, his letter to uh, the Philippians. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 4. And, um, and then later we'll, we'll take a look at chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Uh, verse 1 says, uh, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Chapter 4, verse 2. Um, um, chapter 4 of um, Philippians, verses 2 and 3. Uh, it, it communicates... Uh, similar similar uh, concepts there as well. So just to kind of recap, what is Philippians communicating? Well, number one is the importance of unity. Amen? The importance of unity. One of the biggest things that the devil loves to do is bringing disunity. He loves division. And one of the things that he likes to divide is homes. He likes to divide families. He loves to divide uh, marriages and he loves to divide churches so we have to be careful and we have to strive to follow in what the Apostle Paul is encouraging the Philippian believers and that is to maintain unity also he warns against selfishness which kind of makes sense because being selfish is one of the causes of division is being in order to be united we have a certain we have to have a certain level of selflessness, yeah? Uh, the importance of humility and affirming other people. Uh, this cannot be overemphasized. Our churches need to be a place where we uh, are secure enough in the love of God where we can celebrate somebody else's victory without feeling like we're losing brownie points, okay? <laughs> we as a church need to celebrate, congratulate, applaud the victories and the wins of our fellow brothers and sisters. At the end of the day, we're a family and we're part of the same team. So when my, the brother in church or the sister in church have a victory moment, guess what? Everybody has a victory moment. 
we don't do that enough. We don't celebrate and we don't affirm each other enough. Part of it is because, again, humility is the foundation and many a times we lack that humility. The importance of looking out for everyone's interest, not just your own. And I'll be honest with you. I think this pandemic has revealed to us um, the reality that we need to be considerate to other people. I know that there's been a lot of uh, debates uh, everywhere, not just in, in our local area, about you know the church, about how to how to kind of how do we uh, handle um, having worship with all this con all this COVID nineteen business, and many people are uh, they they you know people across the across the nation are demanding. Uh, for things to go back to normal, but um, and of course our churches are right in the, smack in the middle of, all, of that discussion, and of course we as Christians, the way that we deal with this is not by saying I want to worship God the way that we used to worship Him. <laughs> First of all, that's <laughs> that sounds a little childish, doesn't it? This text here, in a very practical way, impacts our current temperature, our current the current climate. And that is, I must look out for everyone's interest, not just my own. I may say to myself, well, you know, I'm, I'm not at the age brackets of those that are the most vulnerable. Um, and I don't really bother about this, these masks, right? So it's very easy for me to be kind of, you know, selfish and, and just kind of want certain things to, to be a certain way because it suits, it suits me. But this is not what Christianity is all about. This is not what the example of Jesus is about. The reason why we wear masks, the reason why we social distance, the reason why we do the best that we can to uh, live at peace <laughs> with each other, to worship God in the odd setup that we're in, is because it's not just about me. It's about my brother. It's about my sister. And I have to protect them. And I have to make sure that they are safe and that they are healthy. Okay, so this is very, very, very relevant to the, the things that we're living in right now. And another thing that we see here is that the God had demonstrated how to do all of the above. When you see the incarnation, when you see how Christ became human, when you see how uh, the Godhead of prior to the incarnation, they were in fellowship throughout, throughout eternity past, it demonstrates how, how life uh, at its finest... Um, level works and that is through unity that is through uh being humble and affirming each other and not looking only for my own interest but for the interests of others and we see that the god had demonstrated that as well what event does paul expect believers to reflect in their own lives philippians 2 verse 6 to 11 you can read that um as well we're going to skip it for the sake of time but in that chapter you have the, the beautiful chapter that describes the incarnation, the, how Christ humbled himself and became uh, one of us. And this uh, event is the incarnation and Calvary, the incarnation and Calvary. Uh, one of the things I, I must read is, uh, I think it's Tuesday's um, lesson statement uh, at the bottom. It says, Paul hopes that the believers at Philippi, who could be argumentative, We'll learn from Jesus and his incarnation. If Jesus could adopt human form and even submit to crucifixion, how much more should they submit to each other out of love? We are reminded that there is much to learn from the master teacher. We learn from the messages that he shares during his earthly ministry. We learn from the miracles that he performs and the way that he acts towards others. We may seek to model our own relationship with others after his great condescension and by dwelling on his willingness to exchange the glories of heaven for a manger. In contrast, the world all too often invites us to exalt ourselves, to boast of our accomplishments. At a manger in Bethlehem and from the master teacher, we learn a very different lesson. That God's great work of education and salvation is accomplished not by exalting ourselves, but by humbling ourselves before God and becoming servants to others. I, I had to read that because it's so, so well written. Question, what situation are you facing right now in which your humbling yourself could give you a powerful opportunity to reflect Christ to others? Many times we think reflecting Christ is just giving people information. 
Yeah, sharing doctrine, preaching at people. <laughs> That's the easy part, right? Share, preaching at people is easy. Demonstrating what Christ is like is a little harder because it requires your actual, your, your life. You have to demonstrate it. And in order to do that, you have to be committed inside and you have to be, um, you have to be connected to the Lord. Uh, what situation are you facing even now? Please uh, let us know in, in the comment section. Uh, maybe you're going through some challenges and you realize that if I humble myself, this is going to be a great way of presenting Christ to that person. It could be a workplace challenge. It could be a marriage challenge. It could be a situation dealing with your children. It could be a situation dealing with your neighbors. Um, it could be all kinds of different things. But the idea there is that being humble is one of the most beautiful ways of presenting Christ to other people. How does reconciliation lie at the heart of Christ's incarnation and his role as master teacher? If we read 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21, we won't for the sake of time. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about how Christ came into this world to reconcile us to the Father because we had a broken relationship. After Adam and Eve sinned, they severed the ties between God and, and themselves. So Christ came to be the bridge and his death on the cross solidified that bridge. Paul, though, takes it a step further and he says not only did Christ come to reconcile us to God, but he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And just as Christ came to bring reconciliation, we must now bring reconciliation to each other. So the church, followers of Jesus, need to be at the forefront of of burying the hatchet on the ground, not on each other, of uh, waving the white flag, of saying, I'm sorry, of saying, thank you, of saying, I love you, of saying, I was wrong. The church should be at the forefront because, of course, Christ uh, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, and that's why we exist, is to reconcile, yeah, people to the Father, but also reconcile earthly uh, horizontal relationships as well that may be severed. Christ came to reconcile the broken relationship between us and the Father. Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We must repeat what He has done. What are practical ways we can uh, reflect God's role as reconciler? Well, like we mentioned earlier, you can say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Saying I'm sorry is a very, very powerful way of demonstrating uh, the fact that uh, you know we we have been given this this word of reconciliation, and the problem is that many of us want to be right. Yeah, we want to have the last word, and we want you know our to defend our rights, so to speak. But the reality is, is that sometimes sometimes it's better to humbly understand that uh, you know what it takes two to tango. And if there's a problem in a relationship, uh, chances are I may be a contributor to the problem. And uh, that requires humility to actually uh, embrace that and recognize that. Um, we're out of time. There's a couple of more things we wanted to share, but uh, we'll go ahead and land the plane. As you can see, there's a lot to cover there. Um, uh, I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. And as we close our lesson, Father, we're just so thankful that you are a God who is a reconciler, Lord. Help us to reconcile our homes, our communities, our churches. Help us, Father, to not bring disunity. Help us to bring unity. Help us, Father, to not just be so self-absorbed in our personal interest. Help us to think about the interest of others as well. Help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus is our prayer in his name. Let everyone say. Amen. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us. We, uh, we've covered a lot. Next Sabbath, we're going to continue. We have an, uh, our lesson is more lessons from the master teacher. We have a lot more to cover. Uh, remember that the Gospel of John says that if everything was written that Jesus did in his life, in his short 30 plus years life, uh, it couldn't, uh, the books in the world could not contain everything that he did. So, as you can see, there's a lot to learn from the example of Jesus. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, at this time, we are going to have our uh, mission spotlight. And then immediately after, we'll go ahead and have uh, our song service. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we will um, continue to study the Sabbath school 
and our lesson will finish. Uh, we'll continue next Sabbath. God bless. In 1912, the Titanic sank. Istanbul was part of the Ottoman Empire, and the Adventist Church introduced a new way to advance mission. The very first 13 Sabbath offerings supported early mission work in India. More than a hundred years later, Adventists around the world have contributed to hundreds of projects, from building schools to launching mission boats. Countless lives worldwide have been transformed by the generous giving to this offering each quarter. Spicer Adventist University in India has benefited from the 13 Sabbath offering several times. The school has a rich history of teaching and training students for a higher purpose. In addition to the standard curriculum, Spicer's holistic education helps students grow academically, physically, and spiritually. Diversity is celebrated with students coming from almost every state in India, as well as other countries. The campus is nestled in the city of Pune on a 60-acre campus with plenty of green space to explore and find peace from the busyness of everyday life. In the evening, students gather on the soccer field, the perfect place to unwind after class. Thanks to 13 Sabbath offerings, the university has been able to construct a science complex and currently offers several undergraduate and graduate programs in the field of science. In 1969, the offering helped build new dormitories. A few decades later, another women's dorm and married student housing. Jessica is a Spicer student who found comfort and refuge at the university. Spicer is, uh, is my only hope where I can study about God so I can learn more about him and can share to my family. I like the people around here. They are very, uh, very friendly and uh, they are helpful. And I like also uh, the surrounding. It is, uh, sp it is a spiritual place. Teachers strive to create a family-like atmosphere in the classroom and build strong bonds with students. Here in Spicer, the teachers are very close to us. The way how uh, they love us like their, their their own son, and of course the food here, <laughs> the food here is different, and Spicer provide uh, different kinds of food where we cannot get in other university, and they give opportunity for the students to share their ideas and they, were op they are open, the teachers are open and the people around here are very good. Students and faculty at Spicer Adventist University want to thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering. Thanks to God's blessing and your faithful giving, these projects have helped thousands of students receive training to serve God. Please pray for this campus. Pray that God will continue to use Spicer Adventist University for a higher purpose. Thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. This morning, we're starting in the Adventist home it says, Satan and his angels are busy creating a paralyzing condition of the senses so that cautions, warnings, and reproofs will not be heard. Or if they're heard, they will not be taken to heart and will not reform the life. God calls upon you as his followers to walk in the light. You need to be alarmed. Sin is among us but it, it is often not seen to be exceedingly sinful. The senses of many are being numbed by the indulgence and familiarity with sin. We need to advance nearer and still nearer to heaven. I want to know more about my Jesus. While traveling through this world of sorrow, 
I'm on my way to glory land. I'll not turn back for some tomorrow. My trials here I'll understand. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about the mansion. I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland. And I mean to go. Some way, somehow, and after I'll reach that heavenly city, I mean to know more than I know now. He promised when he ascended, I'm coming back, the Lord did say. If on his promise you've depended, you'll live with him in heaven one day. I want to know more about my Jesus. I want to know more about my Lord. I want to know more about the mansion I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland And I mean to go some way, somehow And after I'll reach that heavenly city I mean to know more than I know now So don't give up, faithful pilgrim Stay on the path that's narrow and straight He'll soon be here to take us with Him To our new home with pearly gates I want to know more about my Jesus I want to know more about my Lord I want to know more about that man I'm going to receive as my reward. I want to know more about that homeland. And I mean to go some way, somehow. And after I'll reach that heavenly city, I mean to know more than I know now. I mean to know more than I know now. Can't wait to know more than I know now. <clears throat> In Call to Medical Evangelism, it talks about reform. Continual reform must be kept before the people. And by our example, we must reinforce our teachings. It is impossible to work for the salvation of souls without presenting to them the need of breaking away from sinful gratifications. These things that destroy the health, debase the soul, and prevent divine truth from entering the mind. Men and women must be taught to take a careful review of every habit and every practice, and at once put away those things that cause an unhealthy condition of the body, and thus cast a dark shadow over the mind. Love the Lord is our next song. With all your strength. Love the Lord 
With all your strength, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, I will love you. With all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. Lastly, this morning, in testimonies for the church, God sees how hard it is for us to be patient and forgiving, and He knows how to help. He requires us to reform our lives and to correct our defects. He desires that our spirit should be subdued by his grace. We should seek the help of God, for we need peace and quiet instead of storm and contention. The, religious, the religion of Christ requires us to move less from impulse and more from sanctified reason and calm judgment. I've got peace like a river. Mm. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love
an ocean in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. fountain in my soul.